Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. I hadn't intended on reading from this passage, and at the very last minute, something clicked in my head while I was sitting there. Google searched it real fast. The magic of technology brought me to Romans chapter 3. We're going to read this in just a second here. I want to talk about something that each of you has, though you probably don't think about it very frequently. Where did you come from? What's your background? Who were you before you came to the Lord? I grew up here. I grew up going to this very congregation. I grew up going to this congregation back before there was a classroom building, back when this auditorium looked very differently, filled with faux wood paneling and all sorts of interesting pews. We didn't have pews uh, when I was first sort of little going here. We had uh, pop-up theater seats. So imagine putting your toddler on one of those and having him sit there through the entire lesson. I, I remember actually a lot of you, some of you, uh, who taught my Bible class. Um, there are some very special people in this congregation to me who formed me, helped me grow up in the Lord. And this is my story. This is where I came from. I grew up here. But sometimes I often wonder, what would my life have been like if I'd grown up very differently? What if I had a very different past than what I have today? What if I grew up in a very worldly environment? That's me with a gun. That's, that's just as reference. What if I had grown up very differently, though? So I'm going to talk this morning a little bit about our backgrounds. Because I guarantee you, your background is not like my background. Some of you here probably did grow up in the church. Somewhere, in some place, maybe here, maybe elsewhere. Some of you maybe came from a very worldly background. And it started getting me to think about the question that Paul addresses here in Romans chapter 3. Thinking about my background, thinking about where I came from, thinking about where you came from. Paul's asking this question here about Jews versus Gentiles. Um, and, and in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, What advantage then has a Jew, or what profit of circumcision? Now, Think about the background of the Jews, right? They grew up in a very moral society. They grew up knowing who God was. They grew up studying and reading about God. Who were the Gentiles? Well, they grew up following the lusts of their flesh. They grew up in a very worldly environment, outside of God, not knowing about God, following other gods, even from time to time. And so Paul stops here in Romans chapter 3 asking a really simple question. Is there any advantage in being a Jew or being a Gentile? Skip down to verse 9. He says, what then? Are we, speaking about the Jews, are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. There is no one who does good. No, not one. And so he goes on there and explains that there's really nothing of benefit to being a Jew or a Gentile because we're all under sin. If I grew up in the church, that's not necessarily a benefit to me because I was, I was still under sin. If you grew up in the world, away from God, that's not necessarily a bad thing or a benefit for you because you were in your sins as well. So what I want us to see, instead of you know, looking at our old life and maybe pining away for, well, what if things had been different? What if, what if in my background, what if I had grown up sort of taken the path of the prodigal son, right, and left the Lord and come back? You ever, this is the question that I stop and think about from time to time. Would my faith seem more credible to the world if I had left the Lord or come from somewhere else and turned to him later on in life? Would, would my story about my faith seem more relatable to people if I hadn't always grown up here? This is a question that I have from time to time. And maybe you on the other side, as, a, as a, maybe a worldly person in your background, maybe you've thought to yourself, well, how much further would I be in my spiritual service today had I grown up in the church? Or had I grown up around godly parents? Or had I grown up around people who, who love the Lord? 
And I think it's natural for us to, to want to pine away for the, the grass that's greener on the other side, right? Well, what if I had grown up as, as a worldly person? Or what if I had grown up as a, as a godly person? Each of, each of these situations have both baggage and blessings that come along with them. There's not, as Paul explains here, we all had sin. And as we're going to talk about this morning, no matter who you were, no matter what situation you grew up in in your life, there's baggage that you have to get over. Now that's obvious for the worldly person, but for the spiritually minded, for the godly backgrounded people here this morning, you also have baggage, whether you know it or not, that you need to let go of. But in each of these cases, whether you came from a worldly background or a spiritually minded background, you have great blessings at your disposal that you can use for the Lord. So let's talk about our background. Let's talk about where we came from. And if you're somebody here this morning who has a very worldly background, maybe your parents never really knew the Lord. Maybe you grew up around very ungodly, immoral people. Maybe you were a member of a denomination at one point that claimed to know God but didn't really know the true God. Well, you have a lot of baggage to get over. And the first area of baggage that you're going to need to get over is being drawn back into the world. You think about, this is a real problem that you might face, being drawn back into the world, going back to a life that you used to live. For a lot of people, they're going to have family members who are worldly, friends who are worldly, habits that might be very worldly. And so if you have a very worldly past before you came to the Lord, it might be a very strong temptation for you to be pulled back. And if you don't think so, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 explains this very clearly. For Peter says, If after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of, the Lord, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the later end is worse for them than the beginning. Your old life of sin, an old worldly lifestyle, an old worldly background can be very entangling for you. Though you might be serving the Lord faithfully today, there may very well be a draw back into the world there. And Peter warns against that. And he even goes so far in verse 22 to say that a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. A clean pig wants to be dirty again. And I'm not calling anybody here a pig. That's the, the comparison that Peter is making. But there is a real tendency to be drawn back into the world. And so that's some baggage that you will have to get over as somebody who might have a worldly background. If you came from a very worldly background, there may actually be some very physical and real lingering effects of sin in your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I, I'm, I'm always amazed at the church in Corinth here. And I'm, for as many troubles as they're having in 1 Corinthians, Paul is at least able to say that of all of the unrighteous deeds that existed in their lives before they came to the Lord, they were washed. They changed. They got rid of a lot of sins and, and very heinous things, I think, in our eyes. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Paul says, Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you. Such were some of you. They used to have some of these troubles in their life. And they came out of a very worldly environment. They came out of a very carnal situation in their life. And I don't know which of these sins that they particularly had to deal with. But don't you think that if there was a bunch of people who were addicted to alcohol in that group, that they would be facing very real physical effects of giving that up? If there were people in this group who were actually at one point in their life a homosexual, don't you think that would have been very physically challenging for them to give that up? Our society even goes so far to say that it's not something you even can choose to do, whether, whether you are a homosexual or a heterosexual. And if there were people in this church who had that struggle with that sin, they gave it up. And what lingering effects they must have faced in having to change their lives in that way. Broken homes because of adultery. Broken relationships because of 
extortion or lying or reviling. All kinds of things that they would have had to really physically face though they had turned back to the Lord. When you're baptized in the waters of baptism, it doesn't fix all of the problems, all of the consequences of the sins that you might have been involved in in your past life. And so there's some baggage that you as somebody who has a worldly background might face. But for those of us with a godly past, lest we think that the only people here with baggage are the ones who have a very worldly past, we who are those who might have grown up around godly people, who might have grown up around uh, Christian homes, we also have baggage to get over. It's very different baggage. Sometimes we can fall into the trap of having a very stagnant relationship with our worship. You know, we grew up singing the same songs. We grew up doing the same things. We grew up in the same place. And it might become very easy to fall into a rut and not become thoughtful about what we do, not think about the songs we sing, not think about the worship that we offer to God because we're just doing it again. And that's a very dangerous situation to be in. And there's all kinds of traditions that we might elevate to the point where we think that they have been breathed by God. Uh, the times of service, obviously our, our elders have sort of mixed that up a bit. Uh, but if, for those who think the times of service are, are you know, an apostolic given sort of mandate in some book in the Bible, you'd be hard pressed to find that, I think. Um, as another example, you know, our songbooks. You know, the Apostle Paul did not write this songbook. And if at some point we ever decided that we wanted to change the songbook, we certainly could. And we're not going to go to hell for not using hymns for worship from R.J. Stevens. And there's all kinds of things that we might elevate to some kind of level of tradition or some level of importance because we've just always done it that way, right? The scriptural time of worship is, oh wait, now it's nine. Wait. And one thing that I've been talking to Alan a lot about and something that I found really interesting. We've switched to one service, right, on Sundays. Are we going to raise children when they leave and go to another congregation at some point in their lives who out of tradition even though the congregation they might worship with worships on two services on sunday out of tradition they only worship once because the congregation they came from only worshiped once or are we instilling in our children today the value of being here for every service being here every time the doors are open and that's something that is a challenge even for us here with Wednesday night services. Still something that we face. It's still a challenge that we face. <coughs> encouraging our membership to all be here every time the doors are open. But out of tradition, maybe, maybe your parents never went on Wednesday nights, and so maybe you don't now either. There are all kinds of things that we just need to get over and get back in love with the Lord. It's exactly what uh, Jesus says to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. You have all these great things, Ephesian church, and, and by all accounts, this, this church was probably a second-generation church. It was probably the, probably the next generation of people after the church was first established. And Jesus is telling them what? You, you've left your first love. You've left your first love. You, you don't do this with any kind of emotion anymore. You're going through the motions. All you're doing is standing up. And, and yes, you take very strong stands against false doctrine. But you, you're not, you don't have the heart anymore. So let's get back in love with the Lord and let's not, as people who might have grown up in the church, get so caught up in traditions and stagnation. Maybe we get the problem of lacking empathy. Remember the, the parable that Jesus told the Good Samaritan? Here you see this man, poor man, beaten down on the side of the road, robbed, left for dead. Who are the two people who pass by him in Luke chapter 10? It's a priest who was a very godly person, should have known better, walked right by. It was a Levite who, by all accounts, should have known better, had probably had a relationship with God, but walked on by. Why? Because they didn't have any empathy for this person who was, who was left for dead. Who was it that actually stood up and made a difference in that person's life? Well, it was a Samaritan person, 
Samaritans were, were kind of the lowest people in society in the Jews' minds at the time. But here he was, you know, taking on himself the, the uh, opportunity to help out. Maybe we've gotten so used to these four walls, people who, who have been raised around godly people all their life, to where we can't empathize with people who are living in sin anymore. To where we, we don't know what it's like in our own life to be able, or to be so far down and so low that we're downtrodden and beaten on the side of the road. Do you have empathy for the lost and dying world around you? If you, grew, if you grew up in the church, do you know what it's like? Because you probably haven't experienced it yourself, but can you put yourself in their shoes and do something to help them? This is baggage that we face. Traditions and, and feelings of, of disconnection with the sinful situation of the world. But again, lest we think this is all down and negative and unfortunate, we also have a lot of great blessings because of our background. No matter who you are, no matter where you came from, whether you came from a very worldly place in your life, whether you came from a very spiritually minded, godly place in your life, God doesn't care what your background was. He can use it today in his service. And so if you have a very worldly past, it can be a great blessing for you because you can showcase God's transformation in your life. What better way to show the power of God and the transformative nature of what he can do than to have been living a very worldly, disconnected life from God and making that 180 degree turn to following him like you should. It's the example that we talked about with the Corinthian church. How far gone they, that some of them must have been away from the Lord, but he says there at the very end, such were some of you in verse 11, but you were washed, you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. You were washed. You were justified. You were sanctified. You have changed. And what a great way to show the world the power of God than to make that change. Now, for some of us who grew up in the church, that change might not be as great. That change might not be as obvious or out, as outwardly seen. But for somebody who came from a very worldly background, that's going to be a very obvious change, like it was for this Corinthian church. And so not only that, you have an opportunity to be very relatable to the world. Having come out of the world, having lived a life of, of sin, and having maybe been very familiar with, with being away from God, you can be relatable to the sinful, lost, and dying world around you. It's kind of what Paul was able to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. Paul's interesting. Because I don't know, in my mind, where Paul fits in these two categories. Maybe it's an oversimplification, right? You either came from a worldly background, or you came from a godly background. Maybe that's, maybe that's too simple. Because what was Paul? Well, he was a, as he's going to go on here to say, he's, he is, you know, he was a Jew. He, we'll read later on in the lesson, he was a very good Jew. He was a very good, uh, well-respected Jewish man. But he was totally against Jesus Christ. To the point where he was persecuting people for their faith. So did he come from a worldly background or did he come from a godly background? Sort of a little bit of a mix of both, right? And he says here in chapter, six, or chapter 9 and verse 19 of 1 Corinthians, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. To the Jews I became a Jew that I might win the Jews. To those who were under the law as under the law that I might win those who were under the law. Verse 22 he says, To the weak I became as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. So Paul says, you know, I, I use my background to my advantage. I was a Jew. And when it's convenient to do that, I will use that background. I will be a Jew for people who need me to be a Jew. I will, I will approach people who are Gentiles without holding up my Jewish tradition. I'll let go of all of that and approach them like, like they know their life to be. We need to be relatable to the world. And if you have a very worldly background and you've changed and you've turned from that, you can relate with your story to the world. How can you tailor your approach as somebody who came from the world 
in order to, to affect the heart of someone else when you teach them. And I think you have a very strong and powerful tool at your disposal being able to do that. But even for those of us who have very godly paths, came, came from godly parents, was raised in the church, obviously, yes, we also have blessings that we can use too. We can be firmly rooted in faith. And what better example do we have from this than Timothy? Timothy is, is by and large, one of the greatest examples of somebody who was really raised to know God. And we know that because in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, Paul says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also, Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. As people who were raised in the church, we, are, we can be firmly rooted in the faith very quickly. Why is that? Because I have a very strong support system. I have everybody that I grew up with and know and my friends are part of the church. If I was just one day to decide I didn't want to be here, Let's say on a Wednesday night. Do you know how many of you would be asking me where I was on Wednesday night? Do you know how quickly my mom and dad would be getting on me about where I was and my grandma? You know, when you have a very strong support system, having grown up in the faith, you've got a lot of eyeballs watching out for you. Really quickly, people who really care about who you are and what you're doing. Not to say that they don't care about people who came from worldly past, but my parents, my mom and dad, my wife, everyone that I know, all of my friends are all very spiritual people. And they're all going to take me to task for that. And so I can be firmly rooted in the faith like, like Timothy was in his life because his, his mother taught him the faith and his grandmother taught him the faith. And then he grew up to know the faith and to be very firmly rooted in that faith. And so we have a blessing as people who grew up in the faith, but we can also be equipped for the, for the fight. If you look back at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, Paul gives him an instruction to do something very important. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were called, also having confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. What is, what is the fight of faith? It's a good fight, but it's a fight. It's an actual active battle that we face. And when I think about the battles that are involved in fighting for the faith, I think about all of the times that I grew up hearing faithful people fighting battles and talking about battles that were hard fought. Things on institutionalism, things on instrumental music, things on doctrinal issues that are very important and we need to understand the answers for. I saw those battles growing up from a very early age. And as somebody who grew up in the church, I'm well aware of what things happened and why they, they were done the way that they were done. And so for those of us who grew up in the church, maybe this is looked at as negatively, right? Because maybe some preachers overemphasized some of these battles that were being fought at the time to the exclusion of more important things. But we know about the battles that were fought and we're equipped to fight those battles today. So it's a benefit and a blessing that we have. So let's, let's wrap this whole thing up by looking at Philippians chapter 3. You look at your background. Who are you today? Where did you come from? Are you, a, are you somebody who came from a very worldly background? Are you somebody who came from a, from a godly background? Paul says some things here about his own life, and as we kind of talked about, Paul's a very interesting character because I think he kind of straddles the fence between these two categories. He says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. This is kind of, Paul is, I think, being somewhat sarcastic here about these people who were, would try to put him down as an apostle, would try to would try to belittle him. And Paul's saying, look, I've got way more things to boast about in my past than a lot of other people do. And then he goes on to list those things in verse 5. Circumcised on the eighth day 
of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Well, that's a pretty good list, right? I mean, aside from the persecuting the church part, like if you really look at all the rest of it, Paul was a very good Jew. And as a Jew, if they didn't believe in God, yeah, he was even going so far as to persecute the church, as to, to fight the fight that he thought was right to fight. But what things were gained to me, these things I have counted loss for Christ. All that stuff in my background, all that stuff in my history, that's all lost. I don't value any of that anymore. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So what does he say? I could be very proud of my background. I could be very proud of who I was, but you know what? I gave that all up. I don't look at that anymore. I don't think about that anymore. That's my old man who's lost, who's gone away, who's dead in sin, and now I've turned to Christ. And all that stuff that was behind me is behind me. So what lessons do we get from this? Focusing on the past can be really distracting. What would Paul's service have been if all he ever focused on was how great of a Jew he was? Would he have been able to approach the Gentiles? Would he have been able to approach, approach the weak? Would he have been able to tailor his message in such a way that could be a, a relatable and approachable to other people? If all he was ever so focused on was how great of a Jew he used to be? He counted all that stuff for loss. And focusing on our past can be really distracting. Wherever you came from, I don't know where you came from, if you were, were raised in the church, relying on that, thinking about that all the time, isn't going to do you a whole lot of good. If you grew up in the world, focusing on that and, and having a lot of guilt maybe for some of the things that you used to do in your old life, that's not going to be very useful for your service today. It can all be very distracting, thinking about things that you can't change. What is important, though? God only cares about who you are today. That's powerful. I'm sorry, but that's powerful to me. God doesn't care who you were yesterday. He'll hold you accountable for those things that you haven't made right with him for those things that you did yesterday. But if you've repented of those things that you used to do yesterday, he only cares about who you are today. He only cares about the kind of person you are right now. And that's what Paul's saying here. I count all these things for loss. For the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, count them as rubbish or trash, that I may gain, gain Christ and be found in Him. Are you found in Christ today? That's the most important thing. But He can use your past for His glory. You know, He doesn't give us a, a background check when we come to Him. He doesn't, he doesn't say, well, you meet, you meet the, the bill. Hand in your resume before, before coming to me. He doesn't care who you were. All throughout the New Testament, all throughout God's word, we see examples of men who came from very physical backgrounds, very fleshly, worldly backgrounds, like the Corinthians. And we see men like Cornelius. He was a good man. He was, he was faithful. He was... He served the Lord, but what did he still need to do? He still needed to turn to Jesus Christ. He still needed to be baptized. He still needed to have faith. And so he did those things. Whatever your past is, though, God can use it still today. And one thing I think is very important from what we see in, with Paul, Paul was willing to share his story. I think one of the things that is so positive about some of the members of this congregation are the courage that they have in sharing their story, sharing where they came from. And that's encouraging to me to know that, you know, I, I'm not the only one with this kind of a past, or if you have a different kind of a past, hearing that you have a relatable, somebody who can, who can understand what you're going through in this congregation, that's also very helpful. We're very guarded, though, sometimes, right? We don't want to talk about who we were. 
We don't want to talk about what we used to do. But what did Paul do? He just said, here's who I used to be. Here's who I was. I persecuted the church. I did those things. And I, I, don't, I don't do those things anymore. He was willing to share his story. And so don't hide from your backstory. Don't hide from who you were. But Jesus is worth letting go of the past. He is. If you're found in Jesus Christ, not having your own righteousness, but that which is through faith in Jesus Christ, He will save you. And it's worth giving up all the things that you used to do, all the, the trust that you had in your old life, to turn to Jesus Christ. So that's the question this morning. I don't care where you came from. I don't care if you have been living in sin your whole life, living in the world. What are you doing for God today? And I don't care if you grew up in the church. I don't care if you grew up around faithful people. I don't care if you have, have been singing the same songs for your entire life. If you haven't committed your life to the Lord in baptism and in faith and in repentance of your sins, you are lost. And that's hard to see sometimes when you came from a very moral situation in your past. Maybe more easy to see when you came from a very worldly situation in your past. But in either case, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you are a person with a worldly background or a spiritual background, Without Jesus Christ, you're lost. If we can help you find him and come to him and be baptized in his name today, please come as we stand and sing.